Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. Me and my wife set out to go on an overnight camping trip in the country. I go hiking and camping fairly often, and my wife sometimes accompanies me out on my outings. This time, we went about 30 miles southeast from where we live in Nagadoches to some remote family-owned land. Our land is on a small blacktop county road, and few people live there. Only one neighbor lived close by, an old woman across the road. The road parallels Sam Rayburn Reservoir for several miles and is a short distance from it at this point. It was late afternoon when we arrived there. Wildlife are plentiful in this area with deer, bobcat, and hogs. And since I occasionally would hunt deer there, I put out some corn for them to get ready for the season, and then we set up our camp. We have a small storage building that family and friends use to sleep in on our hunting and camping outings. After we were set up for the night, I started a fire about five yards away from the building to roast hot dogs on. It was beginning to get dark at this time. We have a camcorder that we always take on our trip, and I filmed the outing. I remembered that as it had gotten dark, dogs could be heard across the nearby road barking like crazy. Up to this point, I filmed everything, but since I was getting hungry, I stopped to make me some supper. My wife was sitting down on a makeshift chair, and I was at the fire. Suddenly, a loud howl or hoot came from the nearby creek bottom, a distance of about 70 yards. It was very loud and sounded almost baboon-like, but also much like a human's vocal cords. We were both shocked by the piercing sound, but before we could react, whatever it was came to within approximately eight yards and screamed again. My wife jumped from her chair sideways and ran to the little shed, spraining her ankle in the process. I didn't know what the sounds were, but I'm sure they were not deers, hogs, or hoot owls, or anything else that I have ever heard. I could not be sure if it was not some prankster, although someone would risk getting shot coming to a person's camp at night like that. I ran to the shed to get my pistol, which I always carried on our outings. All the while, the animal screamed the same sound in rapid succession about seven times in all. The sound emanated from behind a pile of tree limbs placed there on the previous outing. I went to the edge of our camp and shined my flashlight into and around the pile and held my pistol ready, but no more sounds were heard. I couldn't see any eyes shining in my flashlight beam either. Even though we were a little unnerved by this event, I planned to go ahead and make our beds for the night, but my wife's ankle was beginning to swell and she was in pain. So we packed our things and went back home. I've gone back a few times since then, but have not noticed anything strange. So if it wasn't a Bigfoot, fine. I just don't really know what it was. All the experienced outdoorsmen I have talked to and about the sounds say they have never heard anything like them either. Dogs from across the road were barking like crazy for about an hour up to the time the sounds were heard. The barking was in the direction that the hollering sound began from. It was around 7 o'clock and it was clear and cool. The area is typical of eastern Texas with dense forest and creek bottoms. Sam Rayburn Reservoir is within walking distance through the forest from the site. A small pond is on our land as well. The screams or hollers came from behind the dam of the pond where runoff flows through a creek bottom. The terrain is somewhat hilly in this area. There is a mixture of pine and hardwood forest on our property. Some areas surrounding this land have been partially clear-cut in recent years. Me and my wife were the only ones involved. 
We were cooking hot dogs on an open fire. On to the next one. At around 11.25 a.m., a hunter near the Sulphur River in Delta County was in a thicket waiting for his brother to show up. The brother was late, so he was eating the cookies that he had packed for him. All of a sudden, the cattle behind him and the other part of the herd across the other side of the pasture stampeded to the center of the pasture. The cattle all met in the center of the field and stampeded off to the south together. The boy had not startled them as they were used to him. He went to turn around to see what had stampeded them and looked over his left shoulder and saw something walking on the far west fence line heading northward. It stopped twice and looked in his direction. An icy feeling shot through the boy's legs. The six-strand barbed wire fence only came up to its thigh or butt area. It must have been eight and a half feet to nine feet tall, solid black, and covered the ground in a way that he had never seen. If it was a man, it had to be a good jumper. The boy's brother showed up a half an hour later. On to the next one. I thought I would share a true story with you involving my grandfather and a Bigfoot encounter that happened in the early 1940s and again in the 1950s and 60s. My family is from the Forkland region of Western Boyle County near Mitchellburg. This part of the country has thousands of acres of timberland and large hills we call knobs. Even today, this area of Kentucky has areas that are not habitable due to rugged terrain. My grandfather died in the late 1970s, having lived into his 80s, and I heard him tell this story many, many times. In rural Kentucky in the 1940s, work and money were nearly non-existent, and with him having young children to feed, it was necessary to hunt for wild game or deer for food. One afternoon while hunting in a valley along the North Rolling Fork in an area called Scrub Grass, he told of pushing through some wild willows growing along the banks of North Rolling Fork to find an animal across the stream standing on two feet and covered head to toe with black hair. Grandpa said the animal appeared to be young, standing only about three feet in height, muscular in build. He said the animal's face wasn't distinguishable due to hair covering it. The animal did not appear to be frightened and stood motionless. Grandpa was so taken aback by the sight of this animal, he said his first reaction was to shoot, but he doubted his ammo. Being more suited for small game, he wasn't sure if it would bring the animal down and that he feared two things, that the animal might charge towards him or that there may be more of these things just out of sight in the willow thicket that grew along both sides of the stream. So he very slowly backed away from the animal and back into the willows behind him and then ran, hoping that the animal would not follow him. The next morning, Grandpa took the men back to the area where he had the encounter to find numerous human-looking footprints of various sizes and on the sandbar along the bank of the stream. Grandpa knew the forest well and always believed the animals migrated like birds at certain times of the year. He believed these animals sometimes slept in the trees and on numerous hunting trips he told of seeing them swing from treetop to treetop. When food was scarce due to drought, he believed missing chickens in the night or torn off screens to a smokehouse was these animals pillaging for food. As a child, sitting on the front porch with my grandpa on a hot fall evening in the early 1950s and 60s after sundown, we would hear wailing sounds deep in the forest and Grandpa would tell Grandma to take his kids inside. The area has many residents now, and I moved away long ago. 
But I would imagine once the sun goes down at certain times of the year, these animals could easily slip through the woods undetected by anyone other than maybe a barking dog or two. I was walking through my neighborhood, Bluegrass Estate, right creature witness Dakota Paw, which is next to a large farm. I looked over, and about 30 yards away, there was a hairy, black creature about 8 feet tall, staring at me with coal black eyes. The sighting took place near Danville, Kentucky, in January. It stared at me for about 35 seconds, the witness claimed, then turned and ran away. On to the next one. A huge, hairy, man-like creature was seen in Bracken County in August. Grant, a local deer hunter, claims to have encountered it at 6.30 a.m. that morning in the woods of rural Augusta, Kentucky. I was squirrel hunting that Sunday morning and was sitting on the hill, he states. I heard the movement over on the other side of the hill, and he walked up. Grant described the beast as eight feet tall, heavily built, and covered in wet, dark reddish-brown hair. The reason he called the thing he was because its genitals were hanging out of its hair. Grant says the creature didn't see him at first when he approached it to within 20 yards. The startled witness held up his rifle and shot up in the air to scare him. I didn't want to shoot him because I didn't think my twenty-two could kill him and I didn't want a pissed off Bigfoot attacking me. The creature let out huge gorilla-like sounds, Grant claimed, stared right at him for a few seconds, then ran the other way. He could add no further details other than the creature's eyes were covered by hair. On to the next one. In September, Bigfoot put an appearance in Brethitt County. The creature was claimed to be around eight feet tall, with a slightly human-looking hair-covered face. It fled into the woods when the witness stepped outside to investigate. The thing's mournful vocalizations have allegedly been heard by area residents on many occasions over the years, and were said to sound like something from the pits of hell. Breathitt, like many other Kentucky counties, both near and far, has a history of reported monster activity. On to the next one. Over in Hazard, a large, hairy, upright critter was seen crossing the road one night in front of startled motorists. Years earlier in January, Small, barefoot, childlike footprints were discovered crossing a frozen creek in Jackson, Kentucky. No human children were reported missing from the area. A man named Kenneth White, while constructing cattle stalls under a large, overhanging rock ledge near his home, came upon the perfectly preserved skeletal remains of what he first thought to be a Native American as it was buried facing east, a well-known Native American custom. Noticing some atypical aspects of the burial, White asked Henderson, a well-known Kentucky writer and folklorist, to help further examine the strange bones, which were covered with a peculiar white powdery substance that disappeared when touched. Upon reassembling the bones, the two were amazed to find that the unusual fellow in life had stood at least eight feet nine inches tall. Moreover, the arms were abnormally long with large hands, while the feet of the being seemed small by comparison. The skull measured an astounding 30 inches in circumference, just six inches shy of a full yard. But the most unusual aspect of the skeleton was the facial structure, the likes of which neither had ever before seen or even heard of. The eye and nose sockets were slits rather than cavities, and the area where the jawbone hinges to the skull was solid bone. Seemingly, this creature had never been able to open its mouth to eat or speak. No weapons, 
tool or clothing remains were found in association with the bones, which, according to Henderson's account, occupied a position five feet below the ground, indicating that they had been placed there at least 300 years prior to their discovery. Strangely, Henderson related that the burial site looked only a few days old, with no sign of dark-colored soil, usually associated with the decaying of human tissue. The two assumed the remains were those of an extraordinarily large deformed man. In the same area, some 20 years prior, a 60-pound double-edged stone axe and a 20-inch long flint knife blade were plowed up by a local farmer. White later reburied the peculiar bones and no official examination of them was ever conducted. Henderson died in March of 1995 without ever disclosing the exact location of the burial site. Another early account, as recorded by Henderson, comes from Bragg County. In 1935, three trappers, James Collin, Wilgus Pratter, and Dale Carpenter, were out checking a trap line they had lain in a remote section of Quicksand Creek when they found that all of their traps had been sprung but were empty. Every single animal had either escaped, been freed, or was stolen from the trap. This was mighty perplexing to them. So, the three men decided to stake out a large stretch of line overnight to find out what was happening to the traps and kill the animal responsible. They rebaited the traps and, later that evening, stationed themselves about 300 feet apart beneath a long, rocky overhang where most of their catches had been lost, and began their vigil. They all agreed to signal the others if they saw anything with a single gunshot. That night passed without incident, as did the second night of surveillance. But their patience was rewarded when, at about 1 a.m. on the third night, Pratter saw a figure quietly approaching the trap line. It was walking upright in the moonlight, and as it approached nearer to his position beneath the ledge, apparently unaware of his presence there, Pratter saw it was a large, hairy, man-like animal. Hardly believing his eyes, Pratter waited until the creature was within 20 feet of him, then raised his 30-30 rifle and pumped three shots straight into the thing. At the sound of the first shot, both Collins and Carpenter hurry to join their friend. They arrived just in time to hear whatever Pratter had shot as it thrashed around in the thick brush. They then approached to within what they thought was 25 feet of the animal making these sounds and opened fire. Between the three of them, they reportedly fired off 20 bullets in the direction of the thrashing sounds, after which all was quiet and still. The beast was likely dead, they reasoned. They hadn't heard anything running away from the area. Even so, they decided to wait until daylight before entering the woods to search for its body. At dawn, the party searched the area but found nothing. No tracks, no blood, and no trail. Nothing to indicate that the creature had ever really been there at all. These men were honest, sober woodsmen, Henderson stated who did not relate their experience until much later. All three were expert shot and swore until they died that they had fired over 20 rounds at a huge, hairy animal at a distance of less than five yards without killing or apparently even hitting it. Henderson, without a doubt, believed in the existence of Bigfoot. His own grandfather, father, and uncle had encountered one back in 1910, which no doubt left quite an impression on him. The four men had gathered at Henderson's huge four-room log cabin to play poker one rainy, gloomy Friday night in October of that year when a violent thunderstorm struck. The rain pelted the cabin and the wind seemed intent on pushing down the very walls. The game wore on, though, as the lightning flashed outside the windows and the thunder boomed above their heads. Suddenly, from outside, there came a blood-curdling high-pitched scream, the likes of which they'd never heard before, and, so alarming, that it nearly paralyzed the entire group. There was only one thing to do. They immediately grabbed up their shotguns and thus 
armed, raced out into the storm in the direction of the scream. As they neared a field close to the house, the flashes of lightning revealed a huge, white, hairy figure standing there in the darkness. Nearly simultaneously, all four men raised their shotguns and fired. What happened next was completely unexpected, and no doubt the source of much conjecture and debate for many years afterward. Instead of falling to the ground dead from gunshot wound as anything else would have done, the large, white figure seemed to just evaporate right before their eyes. Stunned by what they just witnessed, the Henderson family walked over to where the creature was standing, but they could find nothing there. The next morning, after the storm had passed, they went back to the field to look for any sign of what they had shot the previous night. Much to Henderson's alarm, they found four of his prize hogs lying dead in a heap near the spot. On examination, it appeared that most of the bones in their bodies had been cruelly broken and their throats had been cut as if with a knife. Perhaps even more curious, if possible, was the complete absence of blood at the scene. Another rainy night, this time several weeks later, offered the men one opportunity to discover the true nature of the critter, and this time they were ready when they heard that awful scream issue once again from the field outside. They rushed out to the field and staying close together began to search for the source of the alarming vocalization. They walked a good distance out into the field when they saw the same white figure as before. It seemed not to know that the men were near or if it did was completely ignoring them. This time all four men took careful aim at the creature again Four shotguns blasted out a hail of lead that would kill anything. The beast let out another unearthly scream and vanished into thin air once again. Now, there was no doubt whatsoever about the ghostly nature of the creature. Nothing natural could have survived the veritable hail of bullets they'd unleashed upon it. The next day, they returned and found another hog in the exact same condition as the previous one, lying in the exact spot where the creature had stood. They also found several deep three-toed footprints, which they could never explain. According to Henderson, the white Bigfoot creature was never seen or heard there again. According to investigator, the late Mary Green, a lone motorist, saw Bigfoot in his headlights on the night of November on a night in November while driving through Hazard, Kentucky. The witness claimed that he saw an eight to nine foot tall hairy beast as it crossed the road in front of him at around 7 p.m. that evening. He described it as a cross between a monkey and a bear with very dark colored fur. It made sounds like that of a very big bear, he said. After he arrived at the spot, claiming that he stopped the car and got out to investigate, only to find a line of footprints some 20 inches in length along the roadside. If you have an encounter you would like to share, you can reach me by submitting it to the email in the description box down below. Also, if you would like to send in a physical letter of your encounter or any fan mail, I also have a P.O. box, which you can find in the description box down below. I love just hearing from all of you, so those options are available if you ever feel like reaching me. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!